Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study and uh, continuing to look at Daniel chapter 11. Uh, hopefully we can get through verse 25 and 26 a bit more in detail. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this morning, uh, for all your blessings and the way that you work in our lives and the things that you teach us and the comfort that you give us through your word. And we're thankful for your care and protection of our loved ones and, and those around us and the influence that, that we can have for good in spite of ourselves. And we ask, Lord, that um, you can help us in our daily struggle, our walk with you, that we can cling to you, and that you will always be there as you promise. We ask for your presence here now as we open your word together. And um, we hope to see things um, more clearly than we have in the past. We ask that you can correct us in any error. And we pray for those searching for truth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well... Good morning again, and this is something what it's supposed to do. There we go. <clears throat> so we've been looking at these verses uh, slowly, um, picking through them and trying to understand the historical application. And with some of it, you know, we, we sometimes get into dead ends, and then we, we work our way through it. Um, I think it's good for people to see us doing this, um, because... You know, what we're doing is it's not some uh, uh, preset idea that we come to with these studies. We're, we're studying together. And uh, obviously, I do most of the talking, which you know, I'm leading out. But um, I'm sure that you guys are listening. And obviously, anything that people have to say is always valued. If people want to make comments on the video, um, I suggest they do it in YouTube. Sometimes people do it in Facebook. And I don't look at the Facebook very often. Um, but, uh, and, and people could email me too as well at Theodore James Turner, Theodore James Turner at gmail.com. But, um, <clears throat> I don't usually prefer that just because then I'm, I mean, I'm going to, if you have a comment, it's good if everyone sees it. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, just a couple of more things, just getting back to these uh, spans of time and, and more particularly uh, the span of time relating to our history. So one of the things we found is we had this um, 6256, even for a time. And I just just want to touch on this briefly. Um, and it brought us to by going back from December 25th, 2021, it brought us to the center of that 30 year period of the two 11 nines. So from 1989 to 2019, November 11th with November 11th, um, November 11th, I always say that, November 9th, I knew I was doing something wrong, November 9th, um, 2004 is the center of these other uh, November 9ths. And, and from that, um, uh, we end up with this even, uh, even for a time, stretching from the center of that to June 22nd, 2020, which is an auspicious date for this movement, uh, something to take note of because that's when this movement is noticed internationally. And so you can see that there's this progression of these lines. And then also the 6256 going from September 11th to Jeff's summary of the 391, which is what led us to understanding uh, or at least affirming November 9th, 2019, understanding in the context of these lines. Uh, we know that Tess had that date, um, but her arguments, even though there was some validity to it, on their own would not be very convincing um, in that it was not anything that we had done before, and it wasn't based upon any biblical structure. And so I gave it that, or God did, but through the 391 and a half, it connected to biblical structures and then uh, gave us other dates. <clears throat> and these were a witness against Parminder's movement. Now, um, so this idea here of having the center of the 30 years, we had something similar. So I'm just going to go here. I was just thinking about it this morning. So when we were doing the story of Jephthah, uh, we had noticed that 
the name Jephthah, Jephthah 3316, um, was half the period um, from September 11th to November 9th. So from September 11th, 2001 to November 9th, uh, 2019 is 6,633 days. So if we double it, it's uh, 3316, the Hebrew number, we get 6632. So that is, we can go from the end of September 11th, 2001 to the beginning of November 9th. And um, so that, that to me was a remarkable uh, part of this structure in this story of Jephthah. Now, Jephthah also gave us, though, um, with the Shibboleth, we had the 3316 plus 7641, which is an iteration of Capricar's constant. Um, the 10,957 days from the uh, November 9th, 1989 to November 9th, 2019. So what we can say about this is that these are connected. That is, this story of Jephthah with the Shibboleth and and all that's connected to it, the, the tragic vow, all of these different things. Um, and one of the things we notice is that we had there the June 22nd uh, date in 2020 as the arrival of the second angel's message. So we have that June 22nd, 2020 date in this um, uh, this other structure, right? So they have the, they have some similarities. Now in this one, the center date was October 10th, 2010. So 10, 10, 10, and and 10, 10, 10, 10. That is the tenth day of the tenth month is a symbol of the siege. Um, so there was all of these other symbols uh, that we see here that are tied to what we see in Daniel chapter 11, verse 24. So um, I would think that that's significant. It gives some weight to uh, this division of the 30 years with the November 9th, 2004, uh, as a symbolic date in the center of that chiasm. So, you know, so I don't think we can dismiss any of this. I would think that it's, it's very sound and, and we need to, we just need to understand what it means, right? So part of the problem, we can have these dates and numbers, but it's the interpretation of these dates and numbers that matter. So we can see that even for a time, it definitely relates to our line and it relates to these two periods of 360 years that are seen here, which also connect to our 777 structure. The 343 years connects to January 16th, 2021 is the 343 days to December 25th and, um, and other things as well that uh, we could look at. Um, so these, these Hebrew numbers and what they mean. And uh, so we can definitely connect that to our history as well. Okay. So, so I just thought I should tie up some of those loose ends. There's, there's still more loose ends that haven't been tied up. But, um, now we started looking at, uh, 25 and 26 and we've we had some discussion so part of it was how do we understand um, these verses in the context of the, the historical understanding first that there are differences that we would have from Swearingen and even from Uriah Smith um, and the first one of course is that Swearingen does give us this idea that it's uh, Julius Caesar that's stirring up his power. So he goes back to that history of Julius Caesar, but he just tries to say that he is Octavian. And, and we would have to say that the King of the North here, if we're going to apply it, <clears throat> you know, dealing with the United States, who the King of the North and the King of the South is, and with our lines that we have there, uh, because this is going to be the battle of Actium, this would have to be the Republicans and the Democrats. I mean, at least that's one choice that we have. And, and that seems to fit in with these lines. So they, the idea that this is, um, 
you know, not Octavian as a person. That is, it's not um, Augustus who symbolizes Obama. It's just pagan Rome, which is the king of the north, and it's Egypt, right? So uh, the king of the south as a symbol doesn't necessarily have to be an individual person, right? It, you know, it can, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so when we get to, it says, you know, he, so we're saying pagan Rome, the king of the north, which equals the Republicans, shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. And what we say, and that's Egypt is the king of the south. So that's the Democrats with a great army. So this is earlier. So this is the precursor to all of that history uh, dealing with uh, Rome and Egypt. When we get to, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. Well, this king of the south here that stirred up would be under Antony, Mark Antony, right? So, uh, but he shall not stand. So we know that Octavian defeats him in the Battle of Actium. And then we, we discuss they shall forecast the vices against him. Well, the question was, who's they and, and who's him, right? So simple question to ask. <clears throat> now, now, what did we discuss about who they and then Okay, what would normally be said, uh, they shall forecast the vices against him. So who would him be normally at, in, in a normal, regular interpretation of this? So would it normally be a king of, <clears throat> king of the north? Okay, so you're saying that... Um, I'm asking uh, if it wouldn't normally be. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So you're saying that uh, if, if it was normally that, for they... They'll forecast devices against him. They could be uh, Antony and Cleopatra, and and they're forecasting devices against the King of the North, right? So that's okay. that would be that's what you're saying that uh, the regular view is. Now, so uh, just going to read what Uriah Smith says. So sometimes it's not really clear exactly how he's interpreting particular verses but um, so here's what he says by verses 23 and 24 we are brought down to the side of the league made between the Jews and the Romans in 161 to the time when Rome had acquired universal dominion so we're going to go back there and we're going to go now to this period later so we're going to go to the battle of Actium uh, the verse now before us brings us a view of vigorous campaign against the king of the south, Egypt, and the notable battle between mighty armies. Did such events as these take place in the history of Rome about this time? They did. The war was between Egypt and Rome, and the battle was the Battle of Actium. And let us consider briefly the circumstances leading to the conflict. Um, so he's going to just give some of the background about the ships and the, the battle, which I don't think are important details. Um, so it says, um, the, the next spring, both armies in the motion of land and sea, the fleets at length entered the Abracian Gulf in, Epir- in Epirus, and the land forces were drawn up on either shore in plain view. Antony's most experienced generals advised him not to hazard a battle, um, by with his inexperienced mariners, which it doesn't make sense as a sentence, but send Cleopatra back to Egypt and hasten at once into Thrace or Macedonia and trust the issues to his land forces who were composed of veteran troops. But illustrating the old adage, uh, quum dies perideri volt prius dementat, him whom God wishes to destroy, he first makes made. And infatuated by Cleopatra, he seemed desirous only of pleasing her, while she, trusting to appearances only, deemed her fleet invincible and advised immediate action. The battle was fought on September 2nd, 31 BC, at the mouth of the Gulf, Gulf of Embracia, near the city of Actium. Um, so, the, he just says nothing about this, the, um, well, he does say here, he says, the battle of Douglas makes the beginning of the time mentioned in verse 24 as during this time devices were to be forecast from the stronghold or Rome 
and we should conclude that at the end of that period, Western supremacy would cease or such a change take place. So I think what he's doing, which is what we discussed, when it talks about they shall forecast their devices uh, against the strongholds or from the strongholds, even for a time, and then when it talks about uh, for they shall forecast devices against him, the way that this would be understand that is that they would refer to the forces of this army, but coming against uh, Mark Antony, right? So, so this would still be something where the one that's forecasting his devices is the king of the north. That would be uh, the understanding here. So, so I think that's that's a little bit, the, you know, that's my understanding of how it would be uh, seen by most people. So the forecasting of the devices are against Mark Antony by uh, Augustus. But it, but then it says they shall forecast devices. So the question was, why would it be they? And so, so I, I don't know the answer to it. All I know is that it's plural and that, that that is unusual in this, in this, the way that this is written. So that they couldn't refer to the he or the him is what I'm trying to say. Well, okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, because, because you brought this up that Smith had been referencing in verse 24, mm-hmm. I'm ask, I'm, I'm going to ask a, what may be a strange question. The translators in 1611, and then this was adhered to in 1769 mm-hmm. in the King James made notes about Daniel 11.23 and 11.25 okay. occurring at the time of the Third Macedonian War, 171 B.C. and 170 B.C. Mm-hmm. Is it possible that as we're looking at this in the in the micro manner, is there also a macro that if we if we were to zoom out that this shows the spread of the errors that have come because of the Catholic Church as okay. well, you know, yeah, I'm not sure I understand like the error that they're they're trying to apply this to Atticus and to still to Greece and not having Rome here at all. Well, no, I mean, the the translators were applying this to rise of Rome, and we're applying it <clears throat> to the completion of that rise. In other words, we're looking at this as an entire an entire period. Well, I'd have to say no. Okay. Um, so... I mean, because their their interpretation is so grounded in Atticus Epiphanes as being the one who defiles the temple um, that it it just doesn't follow, right? So I agree that that does not follow. Yeah, I you just said you said that they make a comment on verse twenty three. Yeah. But what do they say? It's it's not here in my uh, treasury of scripture knowledge. It was noting that this portion was fulfilled in 171 BC because Antiochus comes more to the forefront of history between 170 and 168. Mm -hmm. But in 171 is the beginning of the third Macedonian war where Rome is, is taking out, um, the king of Thessalonica and Macedonia. And so, so this league then is who, according to them? Where the king of Macedon has sought a league with the other Greek city states to battle Rome. And by and large, he is rebuffed. They don't want to, to go to war against Rome. Yeah, I I wouldn't accept that. Okay. Yeah, it's 
I mean, we have this league. This is the league in 161 to 158. Um, it's the Jewish Roman League. It it can't have another application in this historical sense. Right? It's not going to be <clears> – <throat> Because, you know, that's not what we're doing with even for a time. Because we could say, well, with the even for a time, you know, we have two different periods, right? But it's not really the same. Right. right? It's, it's a little bit different because they're they're based on the same interpretation in the sense of, of what's happening. Here, this would be really contrary interpretations. And you would have to accept, if this is Antiochus Epiphanes, you'd have to accept you know, Tychus Epiphanes had something to do with the desolation of the temple that is is being referred to in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, right? So there's a whole interpretation based upon Antiochus Epiphanes. And um, Parminder tried to do this, right? So he tried to say, well, we can look at it as Antiochus Epiphanes, and we can also look at it uh, as as wrong we could do both and i don't think that we can do that um and and he would say well you know tychus epiphanies is is the real interpretation as well um and and of course the antiochus tychus epiphanies interpretation part of that is um related to the idea that the book of daniel was written in the second century bc Right, so that it's not written by Daniel. That that would be, you know, definitely in in the modern view, they want to have the Tychus Epiphanies because, you know, they don't really believe in the inspiration inspiration of the scriptures. So Daniel couldn't have been written and given us all this history prior to the time. And obviously, you wouldn't have him referring to, you know, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. in Daniel chapter nine, or anywhere in, in Daniel because, you know, he can't predict the future. So I don't know. I just, I, I wouldn't see the need of it. It would just create confusion and it would, um, I don't know how that would even relate to the present truth application. So, so I'd say no. Okay. So, so when we look at verse 25, if we get back here, I'm not sure how that was related to, what we were talking about, the forecasting of devices. Um, because to me, uh, there should be a consistency in this forecasting of devices. But the, the thing that we have is the they, for they shall forecast devices. When the other one, he shall forecast devices against or from the strongholds, even for a time. Right. So we have... <coughs> We have uh, these two periods of time that that are, are going to be referenced here. Um, and then he shall stir up his power and courage against the king of the south with a great army. So, as we said, that would be Julius Caesar um, in the preliminary events that lead finally to uh, the king of the south being to, shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. Uh, but he shall not stand for they shall forecast devices against him. So, so the they then, that's just in trying to understand that, um, this can't be, uh, Rome. It, it just on its own, right? That's kind of the idea. Now, um, when we looked at Swearingen, I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. So I think that with a very great mighty arm against the king of the north, they would come. Okay, so he says, after Caesar's death in 44 BC, the king of the south would be stirred up to battle once again, coming with a, a very great and mighty army against the king of the north. This would become a reality through the influence of Mark Antony, whose authority over Egyptian affairs after the death of Caesar had essentially made him the king of the south, while pagan Rome, under the authority of Octavian, would constitute the king of the north. So I have no problem with, at that time, Octavian being the king of the north. So but the king of the north at the beginning of the verse can't be referring to Octavian because he's not there at that time. right? But he is there at the, at the Battle of Actium. So 
this growing rival rivalry would lead to an inevitable showdown for the control of the Roman world. Antony had initially formed an alliance known as the Second Triumvirate with both Octavian and Marcus Amelius Lepidus in 43 BC, with the express purpose of eliminating the murderers of Caesar and removing their own political opponents. When the triumvirs divided the empire in 40 BC, Antony assumed control of the eastern provinces, which would include Egypt, thus making him the king of the south, while Octavian would retain portions of the north and west, which would include Rome itself, thus making him the king of the north. As it turned out, Antony's involvement in Egypt would expose him to the romantic su su suggestions of Cleopatra, right? So there's going to be this whole situation there with Cleopatra and, as we read, same kind of thing in Uriah Smith. Um, <clears throat> so we have the Battle of Actium, and he doesn't say anything about the forecasting of they shall forecast their devices against him, right? So he's not going to refer to that. Um, but if you try to imply it, it would seem uh, that that is what he's saying, for he says, as it turned out, by the time Octavian had arrived in Greece to join up with Agrippa, that's the one who's commanding the fleet, Antony had been cornered in the Gulf of Ambracia, as he attempted to break out of the situation, the naval forces of each side would meet head on just outside the Gulf near a place called Actium, which is says very similar to Smith. Even though Antony and Cleopatra had superior numbers in the ensuing naval battle, Cleopatra would abandon her partner at the height of the conflict. Coming to realize that Octavian had the upper hand, she would withdraw her naval forces and retreat to Egypt, leaving Antony to suffer a humiliating defeat which isn't correct because he actually goes back with Cleopatra, right? He says he eventually managed to escape to Egypt, which is wrong. Anyway, but his land forces defected to Octavian and only one quarter of the fleet survived to return to Egypt. When the land of the Nile fell to his rival in the next year, Antony would not stand committing suicide with Cleopatra, thus allowing Octavian to emerge as master of the Roman world. So when it says, um, so it does, he doesn't address this, right? So he doesn't, uh, give us any understanding of forecasting his devices. <clears throat> they, they forecasting their devices against him. So, so we have Uriah Smith's view that this is, uh, they would include, um, basically must include the army of Rome and all of the allies. Right. Something like that. Uh, now, what are the other options we have uh, with they? Now, we could just say they uh, would refer uh, to Mark Antony and, and Cleopatra forecasting the devices against Octavian. But I, I think that we need to see a parallel between these. So it could be either in response Right. So he he forecast his devices against the strongholds and they forecast their devices against him. And then we have this part, yea, that they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him and his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. So uh, we, we could argue that the they that shall forecast his devices against them or they that for, feed on the portion of his meat that also destroy him, right? So that would, uh, again, relate to the idea that uh, the they would be basically the Roman world, but we have this discussion regarding uh, when did um, Egypt become basically the breadbasket of the Mediterranean area? Right. I mean, there's lots of places that can grow grain. Egypt became later on uh, the one that was feeding the Mediterranean region. So any thoughts on this of how we would sort through this? And we have some symbols like the army shall overflow. We have that overflow, which we know has to do with the Sunday log. If we put it into our time, how would we understand the portion of his meat? They that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. 
And, you know, if we're going to put this into our time, we run into all kinds of different uh, different problems, right? So we're going to say, well, the king of the north is Republicans, king of the south is Democrats, right? So how would that relate? We need to understand this history correctly. Um, so the idea is Rome is dependent upon Egypt for grain. Is it truly dependent at that time? It's one of the questions. And then we have to try to understand what, what this would mean in our time. So I, I don't know, really know what to do here. I don't know if anybody has any ideas. <clears throat> Verse 25 and 26. Our time, is that our year or is that, how are we to, how are we to approach that part of it? Well, talking about our time? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm talking about our line. Okay. Right? So, so one of the things we, we know is that we're, we're, we have this date of 1989 and, um, that's going to be in our history, Paneum, right? Because Raphia is going to parallel 1798, right? So when the king of the north defeats the king of the south, that's 1989. But we also know that it can represent November 9th, 2019, right? That it can represent uh, a battle going on between the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, that is that history. There is a battle going on. But we know that in our history, we have that there's Raffi and Panea. And so Raffia, we have an application of it to January 6, 2021. And so how do we take this, the King of the North defeating the King of the South, if this is Republicans and Democrats? How do we take that in our time? Is that something that's still future? Or is this referring back to some other event when the Republicans defeat the Democrats, right? So um, I would say, it to me, it would seem to be something future. I wouldn't, you know, this wouldn't be Trump defeating, um, you know, uh, Hillary. This would have to be on a broader scale in the future of this battle between Republicans and Democrats, that, that the woke Democrats are going to be defeated which would make this this line um, sort of flowing out of the other verses. <coughs> and, and we still haven't got the complete uh, picture of how to draw these lines, right? So that's part of the problem that we're facing here. We have to make everything fit, right? So if we go back, I mean, here, we start dealing with 9-11, now we know 9/11 is connected to 11/9. So, you know, so is here uh, the King of the North stirring up its power? Is this referring to things that were happening in the past? Is this like a uh, something that's going to lead to this battle against the Democrats? Is it is it unconnected to January 6th in that sense? Right. That is. We know that the king of the north needs to defeat the king of the south. So is this, is this something that's in a response to what has happened on January 6th, something in the future? Or is this referring to, um, uh, something that's, that's already happened? That is, in a sense, have we already had, uh, something that's sort of a repeat of 1989? Has that already occurred? But, but that would have to be the only time we could see that would be when Trump defeats Hillary Clinton. Unless we're looking at this not so much with with elections, but as something else. I, I don't know if I'm making it clear. It's just we have to fit this. If this is Republicans and Democrats, we have to fit it somewhere. And my preference would be say that it's future. It's referring to the future defeat of wokeism by the king of the north. Like this is the backlash to what's been happening, the history that we're in with wokeism. And, and we're starting to see it, um, uh, seeing it in Canada, I know, in the politics in Canada. Um, and definitely there's a much more 
there's much more awareness. And people that I've talked to, people who aren't particularly religious, they're very tired of wokeism. And they know that in public they can't speak against it. That's one of the things that really bothers them, that in their job uh, they can't speak freely. Right? So they feel like they're muzzled, so that their freedom of speech has been taken away. And so that is happening. Now, we could say that the stirring up, you know, is is what had been happening for a long time as far as the North is concerned. And and we do see that there's a battle of Raffia where the South defeats the North, right, January 6th. But that this is maybe on a broader scale. This is sort of a repeat of 1989. I mean, because I don't think that this is describing 1989 solely. The, I mean, we could we could argue that that's what this was. That this is just 1989. This was just describing what we see in uh, Daniel 11 verse 40b, right? So that's that's an option. So it's it's either in the past or it's in the future. So we have those two choices. It's definitely not in the present. It, you know, it hasn't happened. This if we're going to find a parallel with the Battle of Actium. Okay, so let, let's examine um, 1989. Is what, what things here in this verse connect us to 1989? So we have the king of the north defeating the king of the south. So, we're, so we would say, well, the Battle of Actium, in this case, would parallel November 9th, 1989. So what would be, what would be seen here? that would show that. So this would be the broadest way that we could apply it to our history. So we're taking it out of our, our, our immediate structure of our 777 and so forth, and we're just looking at it as the broader structure of the line. So what are the parallels with Daniel 11, verse 40b? Because in Daniel 11, verse 40b, the king of the north shall come against them like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So we do have the overflowing happening here, right? Okay. So we've got the overflowing, and we have the king of the north defeating the king of the south. Is there anything else? Have we yet seen the king of the north pushing at wokeism like a whirlwind? Okay, but what I'm saying is this is just... It's not necessarily wokeism. If we're putting this as 1989, we don't really have wokeism yet. Right? So the king of the South here would simply be the Soviet Union if we're going to say that this is 1989. Okay, then to rephrase my question, mm -hmm. if we're looking at that, do we see the king of the North pushing at the king of the South like a whirlwind in 1989? Yes. Well, he doesn't push against them. Uh, what, what's the, well, what does it say? Shall come against him. Come against him, right? So it's the king of the south that pushes at the king of the north. That's 1798. So we're saying if this is Paneum, right? It, Paneum typifies 1989, the king of the north defeating the king of the south. And could we take this battle of Actium and parallel it with 1989? That's, that's what we're asking. So, we know what happens based on Daniel 11, verse 40b. The question is, does this parallel that? Is this describing um, in type, that is, is the Battle of Actium, typifying what happens in 1989? Now, the question is, there are th things that happen in 1989, like a whirlwind, right? So are you are you asking, is in this history, is there a whirlwind here when the king of the north comes against the king of the south? Exactly. Okay. I mean, as as I'm looking at several different sources, mm -hmm. um, how are they interpreting this as come against him like a whirlwind when it looks to have two Hebrew words involved, one of them being Hebrew 1875. Okay. So, yeah. So we have this whirlwind, 
which is sa'ar, that means a storm. And then we have uh, just this word uh, above or over. So that's the 5921, which we had before. Right. right. So we looked at that word. Um, now the 8175, we looked at this before somewhere else. I'm trying to remember where, why, at least it, it looks familiar. Hmm. Oh, I know why. I looked at it before. It wasn't having to do with our studies. Okay. Um, numbers can look familiar to me. <laughs> so I know that's odd. Because they're all kind of the same. But, um, okay, so he comes against him like a whirlwind. And so um, the idea here is... Um, that, you know, the 5921, I don't know why they don't put it after the word against or against him, uh, why they put the two words together here. I'm not really sure. Um, because you have one word that is a storm and then you have another word that's against. And so, so I'm not sure. Okay. But that's, that's how they do it here in the King James and the E sword. Okay, so the only thing I can say is if you take these words, come against him like a whirlwind, and you count from December 25th, 1991, it brings you to uh, July 28th, 2030, which is the 26th day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar. Uh, that's an inclusive count. So I don't know if that means anything. So just looking at that, those numbers, that's what I could do with that. Now, as far as coming against him like a whirlwind in that history, uh, do we have to have everything that's um, in Daniel 11, verse 40b? Does everything have to be in the Battle of Acton for it to be a type? I guess that would be a good question to ask. <clears throat> because we know we have repeat and enlarge. right? And we know that we could have the Battle of Actium typifying certain aspects of what happens in 1989. It doesn't have to have everything in it. Would we agree with that? So the question is, do we have to have every component? Yeah. In that history to, to typify what happens in 1989. So we don't have, I don't see that it, they come against them like a whirlwind. Right. I don't see the in that in looking at the history. They're not like suddenly overwhelmed by uh, and they call it the days of the whirlwind. That was either Time magazine or Newsweek or something <laughs> referring to to what happened. Now this is of course written later, um, just looking back on that history of what ended up happening with the fall of the Soviet Union. And it did happen very suddenly. I mean, I wasn't expecting it to happen. I mean, I was expecting it to happen. I knew it would happen, but not then, right? Because I'd read Lewis F. Weir, so I kind of knew that the Soviet Union would be overthrown. But it happened not in the way that I expected. I mean, just the Berlin Wall coming down, that just seemed to be a sudden event. Okay. <clears throat> Now, one of the things we have here is, you know, entering into the countries, right, which one of the things about the Soviet Union is it's all these different countries as part of a union, right? Um, I mean, we don't see that in um, this story with with Egypt. So so there may be just certain aspects that are, are illustrating this. And, and we have the king of the north defeating the king of the south. And we have the overflowing. As far as I can see at this point, that's that's what we have. Okay. Okay. Um, so I can't see anything else. There's nothing that jumps out at me. I'm looking at these. You know, and I'm looking at numbers right now um, to try to tie these together. But um, okay. So you know, one of the things that we have, um, which I've mentioned before. So we have the king of the north and the king of the south, and we have numbers associated with them. Um, if you take the Hebrew numbers, 
um, for king of the north and the king of the south. And um, add them together so the south is 5045. You get this number 20,729. And that's the number of days from the day I was born to November 9th, 2019, right? So that king of the north, king of the south, those numbers are the number of days uh, between the day I was born, February 6, 1963, and the beginning of November 9th, 1989, or 2019, pardon me. Now, now, is that significant? What Does that have anything to do with what we're studying right now? So this king of the north, king of the south uh, symbol, the, the Hebrew numbers. I mean, it's, it's going to be true that I'm going to be the one that uses chronology to affirm November 9th, 2019. Um, but we haven't looked at verse 40 yet, and it's it's... It's there that I wanted to bring it up in more detail. But we are looking at verse 40, right? So at verse 40 in Daniel chapter 11, here I'm just going to go there, right? So these are the verses we're talking about. So if you take, you know, King 4428, you multiply it by 2, you add uh, 5045, and you add uh, 6828 for for north, you get 20,700. 29. And if you count from the end of my birthday, that's the number of days between my birth and the beginning of November 9th, 2019. And, and so we were going to look at this when we got here, but we kind of are here, right? And, and the question is, is that relevant? Is my birthday, uh, relevant as far as November 9th, 2019? Now we know my birthday is relevant as far as the symbols for July 18, 2020, right? And we also have, uh, from my conversion, we have that number of days that the manna fell uh, to July 18, 2020. So we have these ties to these dates. And and it's it's a person, it's just me, right? So nobody particularly important, just an individual. Do those symbols have anything to do with more than just me? Are they just an interest to me or are they an interest to the movement? And if they are, what would that mean? I've been looking at this as being an interest to the entire movement. Okay. Now, now if that's the case, you know, I have to try to understand how that is. So one of the things we know about Daniel 11 verse 40, that it's going to, um, it's going to be replete with uh, numerical symbols that tie to our lines, right? So obviously it's it's a very important verse, just like Daniel 11, 11 was. And so it's going to take us a lot of time to deal with all of these symbols and numbers. But this might help us in understanding Daniel 11, verse 25 and 26, as far as the time elements there, that is where we're going to place that within our lines. So, so one of the things is we see in Daniel 11 verse 40, it's going to start with that symbol 6256. And at that time, or at that time, pardon me, of the end. So we have this other phrase, the time of the end. So we have 7093 and 5265. Five, two. Pardon me. That's no, that's going to be, um, 6256. Set it backwards. And that's pro- approximately, oh, it's, it's like 36 years and a half. So it's 36 years and 200 days. <clears throat> exactly. So, uh, so the time of the end has the symbol of 36 years and 200 days. So what could we do with that symbol? Could we put it anywhere in our lines? Is that the, is that the number between between um, 9, 9-11, 2001, and 10 of 8, 10, 28, 18. No. You, you got it. Is that the Hebrew word between them? You got it on your chart, right? For time or time at the end? 
So we have it, it's time, right? So yes, it brings us to um, October 28th, uh, 2018, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, but you, you, that's what you got on the chart is Hebrew 262. 6256, two, six, yeah. yeah. But now we're going to just attach it to the word end, or we're going to see if it has a relationship to the word end. Okay. So, um, I mean, the difference between these two. So maybe sometimes you don't add them together, you subtract them. Um, so the difference is two years two years and 106 and a half days. <clears throat> so I know if we counted, because uh, I've done this before, so I'm trying to remember specifically. Um, yeah, we did this before. This brings us to February 11th, 2021. If we count 7093. So we, we talked about this before, these numbers, um, the time of the end. So that's Stephen's birthday, right? So, and Stephen's birthday has this characteristic that it's, it's also connected to, uh, November 9th or September 11th, pardon me, because from the day he's born, it's 11,900 days to September 11th. And then, um, it's 1190 days from September 11th to November 9th, right? So if we have, uh, September 11th, and you count 1190 days. No, that's not how it works. It goes from no, from his uh, to his birthday. So if you go to his birthday, February 11th, that's what it is. Um, so if you start on November 9th and you count um, 1190 days, it goes to his birthday. So, so he has this connection between his birthday and November 9th and his birthday and September 11th. So here we have a number, um, 1190. So from his birthday or from November 9th, it's going to go to his birthday, right? So in, I guess the way to look at it is uh, if we go to 2019, and you go to November 9th, you see, let me count, 90. It's going to go to his birthday in 2023, right? If we counted from, uh, we counted from, um, September 11th and it went to his birthday in 2021, right? So, so the point is we have this connection, right? Between Stephen's birthday and November 9th and September 11th. And we have a connection uh, between my birthday with the King of the North and the King of the South, the day I'm born, to November 9th, 2019. So we have a connection. Stephen's connection is this number that we get from the relationship between the Islamic calendar and our and and um, uh, the Islamic calendar in Revelation chapter nine. So it's the Islamic calendar. Our calendar is uh, 391 months on our calendar. Right. That relates to the 391 years. Uh, and, and, and the, uh, Islamic calendar does 403, uh, lunar months in the same time that we do 391 sol, you know, Gregorian months. Right. And that's 11,900 days and 11, 1190, um, minutes. Right. So it's, 11,900 days and 1,190 minutes. And so that relationship between this 11,900 and, and 1,190 relates in Stephen's line with his birthday. So he is. But it, it, so does that make sense? So we have this, these symbols of 1,190 connecting to September 9th and November 9th with Stephen. And I have this relationship uh, between my birth and November 9th, 2019. So the question is, what does this mean? And how does this relate to what we're talking about in trying to understand Daniel 11, verse 40? Right? Because we're looking at verse 40 and saying, well, this, this parallels verse 25. The king of the north, the 40b, 
The king of the north defeats the king of the south. And so the battle of Actium is the king of the north defeating the king of the south. And we have this time of the end symbol, right? So we know that we can, we can connect that to Stephen's birthday as well. So his birthday in 2021 by counting 7,093 days from September 11th. Um, so what does this all mean? I mean, for other people watching this and us making these connections, how, how are we going to relate this to people? How is this significant? We can say it's significant for the movement. Stephen and I have an influence in the movement. Um, definitely with all of this chronology. So <clears throat> how do we connect this to the Battle of Actium? Because I'm just suggesting that the King of the North and King of the South is connected with our lines through mine and Stephen's birthday, right? So we can, we can mark September 11th and November 9th, but primarily November 9th here to this history. Uh, and September 11th in this context is when the Sunday law arrives. So that's the overflowing, right? Uh, do we agree with that? That if we're going to have, uh, if we're going to have this connection, we're going to say it's 1989 is the king of the north defeating the king of the south. Do we agree that, that the Sunday law begins on September 11th and that's the overflowing? That may work. Okay. Okay. So we're saying it may work. Um, yes. So then we could, we could say that what verse 25 is describing is it's not going to have the overflow and pass over. It's not going to have and pass over. It's just going to have the overflow, right? It's going to have the king of the north defeating the king of the south. So it's, it's focusing on November 9th, 1989, not including so much, uh, the events that, I mean, it's going to be 1989 to September 11th. It's going to be connecting that history that what we would call uh, the first angel's message in our time, right? So if that's the case, we could say that um, when we look at verse 25, that this is describing, and, and this, this battle of Actium is describing 1989. So when they shall forecast devices against him, how still would we understand that? So we have, so he shall stir up his power. So this is going to be, uh, well, so in, in this case, if we're going to do it this way, uh, we're not going to say Republicans, right? We're just going to say that this is describing this history that's 1989. So we're not going to directly put it into our history. So we would say, the King of the North, this is uh, the USA and the Papacy. And then the King of the South, here is simply the USSR. Right? So we could look at it this way. So get instead of this being something within the United States, this is just giving us a type of 1989 which means that what's going to follow in these other verses are going to follow from that history of 1989. So that means it's going to go back to 1989 here in verse 25 in the present truth application, because we had, we had an option. We could put it into the future, right? We could say, well, that's going to be what happens with Paneum in our line ahead of us. But we say that we, we can place Paneum in 1989 and we can place Raffi in 1798. And so this is an option. I know it's, you know, we're going, we're, we're looking at this as closely as we can, right? We're trying to find a, where this would apply. And now this stirring up, uh, this five, seven, eight, two means to wake up, like arousing somebody from his sleep. So he's going to stir up his power. And this means to be faith, firm, that is vigor, literally force, as in a good or bad sense. Um, it also can refer to wealth and his courage, that is his heart, um, which has to do with his thoughts, right? The mind, the understanding, 
Okay, and that's the one that's an automatopoeic word, labal, right? Just sounds like a heartbeat. Okay, and then of course we have this word against, uh, and then the king of the south with the great army, that's gadol, an army is just chayil, uh, that is a force, um, right? Uh, so great force, and then the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand. Now, when we look at 1989, um, do we think much about the Soviet Union stirring up a great and mighty army? I mean, in the idea of the Battle of Rafia and Vanilla, in the Battle of Rafia, who has the greater army, the king of the north or the king of the south? Who should win that battle? King of the south. The king of the south in the Battle of Raffia. Didn't they have the larger army? Okay. Um, okay. So it says here um, the strength, the casualties. So, yes. Yeah, so they had a larger army. So they had 70,000 infantry where uh, the Seleucid Empire had 62,000. Um, but there's 5,000 to 6,000. So there, um, the cavalry is going to outnumber, um, the king of the south. And then there's, um, 73 elephants to 102 elephants. So the king of the north has 102 elephants. So yeah. So, uh, I guess it depends how much you count the value of cavalry and elephants compared to infantry. But yeah. So. Overall, the numbers um, are more 75,000 infantry and cavalry to 68,000. Um, now, in this, in the battle, um, the King of the South loses 1,500 infantry, 700 horses, so of their cavalry. 16 sal- elephants are killed, almost, almost uh, 26 captured. And uh, they're going to have 14,300 loss. That's 10,000 infantry are lost to the king of the north. 300 horses, so less horses. Uh, five elephants are killed and 4,000 infant, uh, infantry captured. So I think the, the, the one 26 captured is 26 people. So I'm not really sure. Uh, so obviously it's, it's a battle where the king of the north defeats the king or, or the king of the, the south uh, defeats the king of the north. Right. But it's so so obviously the king of the north is going to have greater losses. You know, to me, it doesn't look like, you know, just in the numbers, like it was particularly, um, you know, overwhelming. But I don't remember all the details of the battle. I have looked at it before. Now, the Battle of Paneum, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to know. They don't know all the numbers, but there's 70,000 men for the King of the South, or pardon me, the King of the North. And then the King of the South has 46,553,000. Um, and they divide it up into different types of, so they had a lot killed. They had um, somewhere between 17,000 and 21,000 people killed for the king of the south. It's unknown how many of the king of the north were killed. So they don't know as much about that. <clears throat> so these are kind of, and these are kind of estimates. I mean, obviously, we don't know the exact numbers. Now, they do mention in Wikipedia that um, when you talk about the battle of uh, Paneum, they talk about the Battle of Raffia as well. So they, they, they connect them historically because this is the response, right? So in these, in these battles, the reason I bring that up, does the Battle of Raffia and Paneum exactly match 1798 and 1989 in all of its aspects? Because if they're types of those, they're not types in every detail. They're types in the fact that we have the king of the south defeating the king of the north, and we have the king of the north defeating the king of the south. So this answers to the question, 
does it have to typify in every detail? Is there everything about the Battle of Raffi and Paneum that describe 1798 and 1989, or even any future fulfillment of Raffi and Paneum, right? For instance, if we take the Battle of Raffi as January 6th, 2021 in, in, a, in one of our lines, um, there's obviously lots of differences between uh, a military battle and what happened with the siege of, of Washington, right? Yes. Okay. So, so we just have to look at, at what things are being typified. You, you could say the same thing about a parable, you know, like a parable can describe certain things. Uh, but you can't take a parable too literally. Parables, analogies, um, break down at certain points. Right? They're not exactly the same. And so we can say these are analogous, that the Battle of Actium is analogous to what happened in 1989. But it doesn't have to match it in every respect. So this is just something we're examining. Right? We're looking at this. Can we take this as a type of 1989? And that would explain, that would affect how we're going to interpret the present truth application. Doesn't really affect the historic application. Right? The historic application is what it is. But if we are, we're going to apply it to our time, it's going to affect how we look at these, the connections of these verses. So what we've managed to do with verse 25 is at least say we can place it in 1989 and will the interpretation of these passages follow as we go through this next week because we're going to have you know both these kings hearts shall be to do mischief and they shall speak lies at one table well you know if octavian and anthony represent something you know the question is who do they represent and we had talked about an application where you know this had to do with jeff and parminder and i wouldn't really like to put it there because both of them speak lies at one table we have Parminder speaking lies. I don't believe Jeff was speaking lies. Now, you could say, well, you know, Jeff was deceived and he he starts to say, well, Parminder's going to be, you know, um, Elisha. I'm Elijah and he's Elisha. You know, um, I'm John the Baptist. He's Christ. You know, those types of analogies. But but Jeff is being is the one being deceived and Jeff isn't making. um He's not intentionally lying. He's not trying to be deceptive where Parminder was. So if we're going to, if we're going to look at this, we'd have to see, is this something that we can then look at in a broader history in our time that relates to our lines? Is this a bigger part of our lines? And part of what we see here as, as we go through these verses, I mean, we're going to see very uh, quickly that we're going to move into this rise of pagan Rome. And and we're going to come through these events that are going to lead us to 1798 and 1989, right? It's going to lead us to this history. And we know that uh, these preceding verses, uh, that the history in connection with these prophecies are going to be repeated. So, so even though this is going to lead us up to 1798 and 1989, um, we have to understand that also... This is our history as well, that we do have the king of the south and the king of the north. And and if we're going to make an application of 40, um, I'm saying that we can definitely connect that to what is happening now. So even though this is, is so if you think about it this way, we have um, history in the past that can typify events in the present, right? So we can have all of these things overlap. They're like wheels within wheels. So you can have Battle of Actium. It can typify, um, you know, Daniel 11, verse 40b. We can have the events of Raphi and Paneum in Daniel chapter 11, typifying what's happening in Daniel 11, verse 40, right? So the Battle of Raphi and Paneum can typify that, right? This is kind of what we have understood that we started to understand once we recognized that what was happening in the book of Daniel is that it's repeating and enlarging Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. 
But that means also we can take Daniel 11, verse 40, which is fulfilled in the past, and it can typify what's happening presently, right? That is, we can say, well, that's 1798 and 1989. But 1798 and 1989 are also typifying what's happening in the present. Can we agree with that? I would think that's possible, yes. Yeah. Now, this was a thing that Parminder fought against. And and Jeff blindly accepted it for some reason. But, but Jeff had been teaching that each of the waymarks typify every other waymark. That is, you can zoom into a waymark. He didn't necessarily say it exactly that way, but we understand you can zoom into a waymark and you have a new line. And Parminder came along and said, you can't do that. You can't, every waymark does not typify every other waymark. And Jeff was doing a presentation after um, Parminder said this, and, you know, and he was trying to use his, well, this typifies, oh, I can't, I can't do that. I can't say it typifies it. And so he tried to put it into some other way, some other wording, but the reality is it was typifying, that waymark was typifying the next waymark. And then Parminder set up this whole system of lines within our history that weren't based upon a typification of a line, right? So he just had, you know, the priests, the Levites, the Nethanim, and then the world. So he had these four different sort of lines. And he didn't have the waymarks typifying them. Um, and it was extremely confusing. So, I mean, I noticed all kinds of problems with it. When I tried to challenge it, and it was being presented by Daniel from Brazil when I was there in 2018. He was presenting this in September. And I'm like, this makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and But this is something that Parminder had presented in 2018 at uh, uh, the camp meeting. Or the, the school, I think. Yeah. So so anyway, um, and that was actually where, by, by looking at what Parminder was doing, I realized, well, this doesn't represent Millerite history at all. So for repeating Miller, Millerite history, how do we do it? And part of the key was understanding Samuel Snow's letters. That Samuel Snow's letters has waymarks that typify waymarks in his line. And the only way you could do this was through typification. That is, you would have to be able to look at a waymark and see if you could create a line by zooming into a waymark. And so, so Parminder's understanding was a complete uh, smokescreen or deflection from the true understanding. He was really trying to undermine what Jeff had put in place. And Jeff, but Jeff hadn't fully understood what he had put in place. That is, he hadn't put it all together yet. And it was uh, really the time setting that we were doing, that type of time setting, connected with these um, dates in the future, November 9th, July 18th, et cetera, uh, that actually helped pull it together, especially once we experienced the dis disappointment of July 18th that sort of proved what I had su you know, suspected regarding the lines, that we couldn't predict time, that we were just in typical lines, not in actual lines. So, so this is what we're looking at. This is how we're trying to understand this. So next week, when we come back to this, um, we're going to start drawing out some of these lines. We're going to go back a little bit and try to, uh, to get these lines more clearly drawn out before we move ahead. Hopefully that's okay. And so it's going to, it's going to be basically repeating all the studies we've been doing, but getting them so that they, uh, they fit as separate lines. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Well, let's pray. A dear father in heaven, thank you for this day. We ask for a blessing, uh, upon the rest of this, this day and the study that we have had here this morning. And, um, we're thankful for the things that you teach us. We ask for your continued guidance in our personal study, and that you can bring us together again Sunday morning to study these things. And we pray for the studies of tomorrow evening and Sabbath. And we just ask for your presence uh, in our lives. Bless each person. May you watch over them. 
And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.